Thank you so much for joining us for uh, today's event. Today we're talking about a particularly hard subject. Um, we're talking about coping with loss from suicide, um, which is something that I'm that I'm aware of it's happened in, in my family to friends etc um, and I know it's a really important subject to talk about and I know it's something that people really struggle with it's a devastating thing to happen um, yesterday we did a session on bereavement and grief um, which talks about coping with long-term grief short-term etc so if anyone needs help from that um, please go onto our Instagram and you'll be able to find links to the videos um, but I've got I'm joined by two amazing people today I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves so I'll go with you first Jessica so um, my name is Jessica Gallia and I'm the Chief Exec over at the Martin Gallia Project. We support individuals that are considering suicide. Um, we, we do interventions every day, talk people out of suicide, but we also support their wider families and um, friendship networks and work networks to teach them the signs and you know how to do that work. And naturally what comes with that is that we see a lot of people that are bereaved by suicide as well. So we offer bereavement by suicide support. I'm also bereaved by suicide, um, I suppose fairly recently. So um, coming up to four years now, um, four years ago, I lost my dad to suicide. Hence the project, um, the project was born out of, out of that tragedy and out of that experience. And it kind of pieced together all these things that we, that we learned and that we saw and we thought, is there a different way of doing this? Is there, a safety net that can be put in place um, for people that are considering suicide and their families and what can we do a little bit better when, when people are bereaved by suicide rather than send, sending them down kind of a, a generic bereavement grief route because it's it's not the same is it so that's me in a nutshell brilliant thank you so much and farah hi um so my name's farah i'm a clinical psychologist uh, recently qualified um and I currently work with looked after children and in an older adult inpatient unit within the NHS. Um, I would say probably suicide has been a very significant part of, of my life. So we, within our family, we've lost two um, cousins to suicide. And I think it's been a topic that has felt very silenced um, within the family. And, and I, I would probably say it's probably guided my career choice into working within the field of psychology and um, also I have a lot of experience in working with people who are either reporting difficult feelings or and sort of I'm quite um, sort of support them to think about how to keep themselves safe um, so I, I would say it's something that is very prominent both personally and professionally. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and as with all our other sessions as well, uh, please feel free to ask any questions throughout the, um, the session. We'll have the Q&A section open so you can ask questions anonymously or you can add things in the chat as well to all panellists um, or like one person or to just the whole kind of group, um, group of us. Um, so yeah, so you can ask questions throughout and we, we have some questions that we've put aside already but please feel free to say something if anything resonates or you need to know anything more okay so the the main question uh, that we have so before all our sessions we ask um people that can't attend to send us questions plus we have a few things put aside for the, about the subject um but the main question that came through from the people that are watch, going to be watching this back is how do you cope with grief from suicide because they asked, is, it, is the grief from suicide different from grief from other types of death? Um, I'm gonna to go to Farah first um, to ask that question. I think, um, I think this, this question feels really um, important. And I think from recently I did a thesis um, thinking about how clinical psychologists made make sense of suicide. And within that it involved so we're doing a lot of literature re reviews on on how people cope with suicide and is that grief different from any other type of grief and i think what the literature suggests is that suicide can um, the impact of suicide can be likened to a form of traumatic grief or complex grief in that you're coping with uh, a loss but it's how that loss has occurred that can add an additional layer of sometimes shame, um, sort of often uh, feelings of anger, feelings of frustration, feelings of isolation. 
um, and by all means, I wouldn't, I don't want to sort of separate grief at all, but my, my personal experience and my professional experience would probably say that the grief experience from suicide can feel much more traumatic, um, long lasting, and can have significant long lasting psychological, emotional well-being um, and cognitive um, implications for people. Um, and often it, it can feel very silenced and that people often report that they aren't sure how to voice that or to to share that with other people because of the kind of shame and stigma that is often attached with suicide generally um so i'm not sure if i'm answering your question but i would probably say that, that the grief response is would probably be understood as quite traumatic and a little bit more complex than perhaps other forms of grief yeah um and jessica yeah i would absolutely agree with that and i think one of the biggest things for, you know, one of the biggest tips I could give for dealing with um, a bereavement by suicide is acknowledging that it's not the same as a normal bereavement, mm -hmm. acknowledging that it is very traumatic and, mm -hmm. you know, the detail that you're exposed to, the things that you've learned about that you've never had to hear about before, all about somebody that you, you love and, you know, care about deeply, it is so traumatic and I think acknowledging that that is a, a different kind of grief is really really important it took me quite a while to you know for the penny to drop on that one and um, mm -hmm. when it happened to me and i think it's it's massively important to acknowledge from from the get-go that we're not dealing with kind of your average bereavement here this is this is you know another level and um if i just spoke about kind of like the shame and the anger um, the feelings of guilt if you're a family member that perhaps didn't see it coming or did see it coming but don't feel like you, you did anything with that or did enough with that um, and yes you go through that you know those grief stages that grief pattern but it it looks slightly different and I think acknowledging that is is key to starting to do that work um, and, and starting to grieve properly and um, what, what I did and what a lot of people I know do is they don't grieve properly and um, we're a lot of the guilty of it and I think with suicide that's especially common because we don't know there's no rule book and it's not like okay mm -hmm. this is where and when you can talk about suicide this is mm -hmm. who you can be open um, with this is who you can't be open with and it's 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 this kind of internal battle of well I'm not ashamed of what's happened and I I, I want to talk about it openly but is that other person comfortable with that and I remember like very very early days after I lost my dad I went into Asda. My mum said, go and do something like really, really normal, something that's just going to kind of ground you a little bit. So I went to do the food shopping and um, and it hit me in Asda. This was the day after my dad died. It hit me in Asda that, you know, this event had happened. And um, I just broke down in the frozen aisle. I was crying my eyes out. And this, this lady stopped me and said, um, you know, are you OK? You're crying. Are you all right? And I was like, no, I'm not all right. My, my dad died yesterday. And she said, oh, um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Like, how did he die? Um, and I said, oh, well, he took his own life. And instantly, um, before the words had finished coming out of my mouth, she said, oh, have you seen the weather today? And she was just so mm. awkward. And that was my mm. first experience of, oh, actually, is this not something that we talk openly about? Is this something mm. that we're supposed to have? And am I supposed mm. to be ashamed and embarrassed and that kind of opened me up to this whole whole new world of bereavement by suicide and it's like a club that nobody would ever ever ask to be in this club and it's about how do you navigate that and who do you talk to about that that can actually understand what's going on and not kind of reinforce those feelings of shame and guilt and anger um, but can actually hold that space and have that conversation with you and let you get those things off your chest that you really need to get off your chest if you internalize them and keep them they're going to drive you mad um and there's there's just no in my experience there's no there's no rule book there's no kind of map for that um and it's a difficult world to navigate on your own i think yeah yeah definitely. i think as you were speaking there jessica it's making me think about sort of the wider narratives of suicide um, in terms of the kind of the cultural connotations, the religious connotations and the historical connotations. I mean, even in the, even in the language, this idea that um, committing suicide, it's kind of embedded within a context of someone doing something that they shouldn't or that 
they're not supposed to. And I think historically that's how that's always been viewed. Um, and therefore people really don't know how to respond when someone has taken their own life. Um, and there is a very swift moving on often because of that, not quite knowing how to respond. But usually if there has been a bereavement or a loss, perhaps people are more sympathetic in how they respond. And I think my experience has been very similar to you there, Jessica, where it's because of that kind of bewilderment or the not knowing that it, it almost feeds into the idea of we shouldn't speak about this. It's too painful. Um, yeah, and people like don't want to say the wrong thing. So instead they say nothing. And then mm. sometimes that's a little bit worse, isn't it? And I actually remember having people cross the street after my dad died and cross the street to avoid having to have a conversation with me um, because they just didn't know what to say. And I remember really distinctly losing a massive chunk of my friendship. Well, my friendship group, I thought they were my friendship group, but I, I'd say probably about, I don't know, 60, 70% of like my friendship group just disappeared and, and not the kind of normal sorry and flowers and cards that you'd normally get with a bereavement, but kind of just this radio silence because they didn't know what to say and it was uncomfortable for them. Therefore, they said nothing. And that hurt like a lot it, it was a massive massive part of um of of that bereavement was was not just the loss of the person that I loved so much but the loss of all those people around me that just didn't know how to deal with me anymore or be around me or even speak to me or even send me a message and say oh, you know I'm really sorry for your loss it just people just got super awkward and it didn't help my grief at all yeah actually so there's a few things that you uh, you both brought up there and again echoing a lot of the uh, the questions that we we've received um the main uh, one of the main things that i think came after those first two like how how do i cope with this grief is it worse is it okay that it's worse is how do people deal with the stigma so how can people not i suppose there's so many different feelings there's there's guilt, there's maybe embarrassment, there's obviously, you know, on top of grief and everything else you're going through, you're confused, um, all these different things. But how can people process, I don't know, the perceived stigma? Um, I'll go to Farah for that one first. I might have to come back to me, if that's okay. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I think that that's a really important question. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay, Jessica? Yeah, that's such an important question, isn't it? Mm. I think, I don't know, I mean, I'm a bit reckless. So my response to that, and I'm not saying my response was always right, but my response was um, to, to challenge that and to um, kind of speak about it even more and, um, and make it like my lifelong mission to break down this stigma and speak about it so openly that people think, oh my God, why is this girl talking about suicide? Like it's the same as hopping on a bus or the same as you know buying a cup of tea because um, it should be normalized to that point point. Um, so for me it was kind of to really rebel against um against this um this stigma and these kind of i mean people there's no malice in it people don't even know they're doing it um but it was i was very angry was very i was never angry with my dad but i was very angry with the world for not understanding what i was going through and i remember thinking how like how are you just carrying on with your life do you not understand what i'm going through here do you not understand what's happened to my little family and i was so mm -hmm. angry and i found myself becoming increasingly angry by people that would say oh i understand what you're going through i lost um a family member to to old age which is obviously very sad i've lost all of my grandparents now and it, it absolutely broke me but i remember feeling that that wasn't fair that you were likening that to to this trauma that was mm. so complex and i remember feeling so angry um, that nobody nobody got where i was coming from and the people thought they got where i was coming from but they didn't um, and for me it was about surrounding myself by with people that were um, in the same boat, unfortunately. And it was it was heartbreaking. I remember going to that first SOBS meeting and seeing how many people were in that room and the girl had to keep bringing more chairs out and more chairs out. And these were all people that were bereaved by suicide. Um, and I only went a couple of times, but to see that I wasn't the only person in the world that was going through this um, and to hear from someone, I understand how you feel and to actually be able to believe them and buy that was so valuable to me um, and like I said none of us choose to be part of this club but there's 
I found massive comfort in in finding other people that that had been there and that actually really did get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think you really inspired me to kind of put my thoughts together, <laughs> Jessica. Otherwise, I would have rambled for a really long time. Um, I think just building on what Jessica's saying, there is this um, bravery that we need that that we need to embrace when we're thinking about suicide and 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 also talking about it and really and being suicide being more of a visible conversation um so i think something that in processing uh grief personally uh, and also having the experience of losing a client within within the field that i'm working at the moment i found the process the processing of that experience to be most shaped by the talking of it and actually naming it and naming the emotion that's attached to it so i remember um talking which I am talking about suicide, for example, I'll, you know, it's kind of, I'll measure the kind of the feel of the room or the, the temperature of the, you know, with, within the conversation that I'm having, but it would be just about naming it. Like, you know, I, I'm aware that this is, can be a really difficult thing to talk about, but it's something that's really important for, for so many reasons. Um, and it's the fact that it, and it's having that curiosity. So although the word suicide in itself can bring about so many feelings, it's about remembering the person and that and the choice that perhaps they've made and the life that they've lived and 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 still kind of holding on to that curiosity about why they may have done what they've done and honoring their life um and all and still connecting that back to um people do take their own lives and it's it's incredibly sad and, and it's traumatizing in in so many ways but for me, it felt it feels more traumatizing to to not acknowledge that and to not acknowledge them. Um, so there, I massively um, echo what you've just said there, Jessica. And you know, having the the guts to, to to talk about it, um, even if people are feeling uncomfortable, because it's not comfortable. We've almost um, been told implicitly for a really long time that this is something that feels taboo and therefore we do not talk about this openly and it is about challenging that narrative and actually saying it's okay to talk about it it is okay to feel uncomfortable um and and it's something that yeah we need to share and I, and part of me um also thinks about processing it through through doing lots of reading, um, I found it really helpful to read up on studies on um, suicide bereavement and to connect with SOLVES, uh, the, the survivors of suicide bereavement, if I'm correct. I think I've got that wrong, the wrong way around. Um, but really to kind of be more exposed to, to the literature that's around um, in relation to, to suicide bereavement, to connect with other people who have also experienced a form of suicide bereavement. I think that connection has enabled me to have more open conversations, much like this, um, which doesn't feel okay in potentially other settings. Um, I feel like there's a lot more conversations happening around at the moment within COVID and we're aware that people who are, um, people, there has been an increase in, in people taking their own lives. So there are conversations on the news and, and there are programs thinking more about this topic. But again, it's having these kind of more informal conversations that I feel make the most difference. You know, someone listening will relate to that and it will spark a question, a query, a curiosity that they might be more comfortable to talk about to someone else at some point. Um, so there's, yeah, I think that there's meaning in talking and there's meaning in, in doing your own research in a way that feels comfortable for you because there is so much available and there is so much support, but it's just that it's not readily, it's not as visible as it probably should be. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think um, oh, sorry. Thing, oh, sorry. Uh, I think there's something massive, massive in what you said about, uh, about kind of naming it. Um, so like, for example, yesterday, um, this um, lovely, lovely writer wrote a lovely article about about my organisation um, for like a, a local magazine, and um, I edited it before it went just to just to make sure it was all right, it all okay. And I replaced the words mental health with the word suicide about fifteen times in this article. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an article about my organisation, which is a suicide prevention charity. 
you're not a mental health charity. We're not there to support people suffering with, with bipolar or personality disorder. We're there to support people in a suicidal crisis. And, and this guy was obviously just, I mean, it was a great article, I can't fault him, but he was obviously uncomfortable with the word suicide. So he put mental health instead, which was, I see that a lot. Um, and I replaced it with, with suicide. And then I obviously gave him a ring to say why I'd done that. And I said, look, it's, it's really important that we're using the word suicide and normalizing the word suicide. A, for those people that are bereaved by suicide and, and you know, it's hard to say that word, isn't it? That they've lost someone to suicide. But B, for when we're trying to prevent suicide and we're, at, we're trying to teach people to ask, have those open and honest conversations and ask that clear and direct question, are you considering suicide? If we can't get used to saying the word suicide, how are we ever going to have those conversations where mm. we, where we you know, prevent some of that? And I think there's a massive thing in what you said, Farah, about naming it and using that really uncomfortable word. Mm. And I think, and I think also using, I think there is something about the word suicide that even sometimes when I use it, I, I become very aware that it's a word that I'm using. I'm not sure if that makes any sense. I, I can use many words and not feel very um, conscious of it, just kind of speak. But I think when I do say suicide, I become acutely aware of who I'm saying it to, what's the context I'm saying it in. And often when I'm working with people, I would often ask about suicidal thoughts, but I might also think, ask about, you know, thoughts around taking your own life, or I might, I might consider the language a little bit differently. Um, again, just to think about the person I'm speaking to and maybe what feels more suitable or comfortable for them. But there is, yeah, there's something about that word. Um, I'm just going to have a chat. Oh yeah, that was me just saying, just reminding everyone that's watching that they can submit because a, a, a few people have just joined. They can submit the questions. So, yeah, um, one of the things that both of you actually brought up as well is uh, like the what ifs and the guilt. How um, can people start to process that? I'll go to Jessica first for that one. Well. <clears throat> Why? This isn't something that I did particularly well, um, but I'm nearly four years in now. And I'd like to think that I'm in a, I, I'm doing better with that now. In fact, I know that I'm doing better with that now than I did in, in the first instance. Um, the what ifs are, I, for me, one of the hardest things to deal with because ultimately you're never going to have the answer. So no, I mean, you learn, you learn a lot through someone's inquest, don't you? But ultimately, you know there was one person there at the time that it happened there was one person that know why it happened exactly why it happened and that person's not here to tell you the truth about it so the bottom line is you're never going to know those answers and the day that i accepted that um and it took me probably about two and a half years but the day that i accepted that um was kind of the first day of the rest of my life really um, because I was tormenting myself with what if this and what if that and don't forget I teach people for a living I you know I do interventions all day for a living um, we've done 869 of them since the start of COVID by the way and I teach other people how to prevent suicide for a living so I, I teach all these skills in hindsight that would have been great to have so that's something that really affected me. What if I'd had these skills then? What if I knew what I know now um, four years ago? And the day that I realized I was never going to have the answers to those what ifs was, was um, groundbreaking for me. And what it came down to was it could be this or it could be this or it could be this or it could be this. Which of those, um, which of those answers serves me best as a human being, as an individual? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not going to know the answer. So which of those brings me the most peace? And I, I worked out which one it was. Um, I won't go into detail, but I worked out which one it was that brought me the most peace. And actually, that's the one I choose to believe because I'm never going to have the answer. And the others were tearing me apart. So I just stick with the one that serves me best. And and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. Farah? Uh, yeah, no, I think... Oh God, I don't know, I think even after I'm noticing that I'm kind of getting quite emotional just hearing you speak there, Jessica. Um, the what ifs, I think you've described it very perfectly there. It, it, 
it could be one, it could be both. There's this idea in psychology and, and within wider literature of the both and. I think some, sometimes we can often feel cornered into thinking, is it this or that? And the idea of the both and is that it could be this and that. And I think that's something that has brought me a lot of comfort in relation to the what ifs and, and how to cope with that. Um, I often think, um, especially working in the field of mental health, you know, we are constantly asking people about how they're feeling in relation to risk. And I remember when um, a client of mine had taken his life, I absolutely, I felt so de-skilled and actually thought to myself, this is probably, I'm in the wrong profession. And I was blown away by how many other clinical psychologists had also experienced the same thing. So there's this idea that even if you're working in the field of mental health or any field, you can be affected by suicide. Um, and that it's such a, it's an experience that so many people share. And I often found myself asked, going through, you know, what if I had intervened at a different point? Could the outcome have been different? And if I'm honest, I've come to the conclusion that it, it probably would not have. And that was really difficult to, to accept. Um, but there's, there's this idea that this person, people can often make a choice and follow that choice through without disclosing anything to any of people around them. And I, I don't believe that that wouldn't have made a difference as such. So I've come, and I think with regards to the what if, even in the, with regards to losing um, my cousins, I don't feel that any intervention early enough would have made as much of a difference. And I think that there's an understanding that I've come to think about, which was, if it's okay for me to say, is, is that this was a way of them perhaps um, no longer feeling in any emotional pain. And for me, that is something that I, I can accept because I don't want people I, I wouldn't want someone who I love and or, or I care for to be feeling that way and, and that's a kind of understanding that I've that kind of sits well with me um, and helps me it, I go back to that every time there is a what if so I've often gone back to with them um, my cousin a cousin of mine passed away he was I think he was 21 at the time and he had disclosed to certain people that he wasn't feeling happy and he was feeling desperately sad. And I don't, perhaps he didn't, he wasn't getting the response that was needed. And, and he ended up taking his own life, I think about just under a year after. So I often wonder what if he did get that type of support? What if he was contacted? What if he reached out to an organization like yours, Jessica? What could the outcome have been? Um, and I find myself going down a bit of a rabbit hole because actually no matter how many questions I ask, I'm not going to get a response so it's more around having that acceptance for me anyway it was more around the accepting the choice that had been made and thinking about a reason of why that was that had happened in a way that feels as you were saying there Jessica that feels, that feels comfortable um, and that I can sit alongside and understand and feel compassionate for for him to have made that decision for all the people that I've, not, I've known who have taken their on that to have made that decision. And I think sometimes even that I'm not 100% satisfied and I don't think I'm ever going to be. Um, so sometimes I've, well, I've almost learned to kind of befriend the what if question. So I'm like, okay, there you are again. It's another question that's popped up because it's, and they do change. So I might meet somebody who has said something and I re it relates back to an experience and then I have a new what if question. So I just, I hold on to it. I try not to ignore it. You know, it's there and I acknowledge it's not going to be answered, but I wonder, I wonder what would have happened. And I, and I can, I can wonder and I can accept. And it's again, that kind of both and response. So yeah, tell me if I'm making any sense, <laughs> but yeah, I'm both. Do you know, actually, so a question came in uh, while we were, while you were answering this question, which actually relates to it. So with both of your lines of work, how do you navigate the emotional impact of supporting to change narratives and help others given your personal losses? And how do you sustain yourselves and hope on, um, hold on to hope that systems and society can change? Um, that's a really, really good question. Who would like to answer that first? <laughs> I think, um, is that okay? I've got something to Okay, them. go for it, go for it. Um, I think something that stood out from that, the first part of that question is, you know, within this profession, how do we, how can we change that narrative? And I think something I often do, and I think I'm, I'm always trying to navigate the, the boundaries of this, 
but it's to all, it's, it's to share. Um, now I might not share too much of personal experiences, but to really, it, it, in, the experience enables me to almost walk in the shoes of other people um, and to really understand what that feels like to be a family member who has lost someone who's taken their own life and to really empathize with the pain that, that they're going through and the suffering that they're going through. Um, and to try and navigate that, I, I will do many things. So I, would, I will always connect with the family member. So I might, I might take some time aside and maybe just hold on to their memory or think about how much they've inspired me to, to do the job that I do and to almost wonder what I might, what I might have said to them if they were here. Um, I might speak to my supervisor. So I'm very honest about my personal experiences um, within my supervision relationships. And I think that really helps me to maintain my focus in any of the clinical work that I do. So I will often share my experiences with my supervisor if there's anything that's kind of concerning me or if I'm holding on to something personal. Um, but I definitely give myself space to to think and to feel and to feel very pulled, but also be mindful that, you know, we are, Jessica and I, we're in positions where we are, we still have a job to complete and we need to make sure people are safe. Mm -hmm. um, and part of, I think, supervision for me plays a huge role in that as well as, as well as, yeah, holding on to that person's memory. And, and actually just, again, and it's going to sound quite repetitive, but recognizing that and being aware that, that that's something that is drawn, that you're feeling drawn to or something that you're really connecting with. Um, because often, I don't know about you, Jessica, but often or sometimes people in, in the study that I did where I spoke to um, 12 clinical psychologists who had also lost a loved one to suicide, who also worked as clinical psychologists. Some people talked about blind spots and this is the idea that because sometimes we have a very personal connection with a topic or a theme or an event, that sometimes we might miss things in our clinical work. So because I'm aware of that and, and I'm conscious that I don't want to do that person a disservice, I will always bring that back to supervision, make very thorough notes. Um, I, I noticed when a client, the client I worked with took his own life, I started making my notes even more rigorous than they were. I was checking and over checking and double checking and making my supervisor check. I just became so much more risk averse um, and, and used supervision way, way more than, um, than I had done previously. I'm wondering, I'm wondering how you might respond to that, Jessica. You want me to jump in? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely, it's about doing the job and doing the job safely, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And recognising when you're not the right person um, mm -hmm. to with that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a little while to work this out. So I felt after my dad died that this horrible situation had happened to me and my family and we're good people and why it happened to us and there must be a reason why it happened to us now I'm not particularly religious um but I do believe that everything happens for a reason and that um my dad's death just shook that belief system I had to the very core because you know what what could be the reason for, for this happening this horrible thing happening to us when we're good people and eventually what what I got from that was that I had this, you know, I had this job to do and this horrible thing had happened to me and I could either let that define me in this negative way or I could let this, let it define me in this positive way where I use that experience to go out and really um, evoke some meaningful change. Mm -hmm. um, and for a little while I was like, I was like, I can save the world and there's no boundaries to that, there's no limits to that, which was really, really unsafe. Um, so, like you said, it's about doing it and doing it really safely. So, um, I don't do as much client-facing work now as I used to because we've got we've got full-time members of staff, and I, you know, run the organisation, run the organisation. But occasionally, I do get back on the front line and do those interventions. And sometimes, I'll have someone that comes to me that is like a carbon copy of my dad. So it'll be um, someone in their mid fifties. Um, that has some problems with alcohol um, is is perhaps having some housing issues and I start kind of getting these little red flags and I think no I'm not the right person to deal with this this mm -hmm. isn't safe for me and, and in turn it's not safe for you mm -hmm. and it's about being really honest with yourself and saying I can't give you the best standard of care here because 
mm -hmm. this is too close to home for me. Yes, I deal with suicide every day, and I'm, I, I know my limits with that. But when when someone comes in that is it's it's too close to home, I've got to call it and and say mm -hmm. no this isn't good for me it's not safe for me it's definitely not safe for you and get one of the one of the other guys to to pick that up um and i think that's really important and it, and it all comes back to that looking after yourself thing doesn't it and um again something that took me a long time to to work out how to do um and, and it all comes down to like self-care and i'm not talking about you know like personal care like washing your hair brushing your teeth but like actually caring for yourself um as much if not more than you you know you're caring for other people because you get to a point of burnout where mm -hmm. you can't help anyone and i got to a point of burnout where you know I, I couldn't even um look after my own child properly i mean i did i did but it was a challenge but mm -hmm. um but it's about being really honest and really reflective mm -hmm. in the work that you're doing because the work is mm -hmm. so so heavy mm -hmm. uh, and we can only all do so much. There's a limit to what we can all do safely. And there's been times before we had the funding to take staff on where it was like a revolving door. It was like Piccadilly Circus in our building of people coming in one after the other for an intervention. And I was the only person that was there. And I've done like 10 really serious suicide interventions on the bounce like that. And it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe for me at all. And I think it's about reflecting on that taking it to supervision um, and being really quite honest with with others and with yourself about where those boundaries and where those limits are because it is yeah. such a um you know it's such a subject that that can provoke so many emotions especially mm -hmm. personally and or professionally yeah. and i think and i think when um in the, in the in the study that i did there was a theme around um feeling very triggered when people were working with others who were either who had either taken their own life using methods that were very similar to the to the person that they knew other that whether that's a relative or a loved one or a client so i think it's important to recognize when that does happen as you were saying there jessica i think you know when we're working in this field we're very skilled and competent and able to do so but there will be sometimes those particular moments when it just feels very very similar and it can and it's important to look after your own mental health and well-being as well um, so knowing when to step back and and transfer that that situation or that, that person to perhaps a colleague um, where they can also receive that care and also looking after your own well-being um, I cannot I can honestly say when there has been a very similar when the methods used have been very similar people in my study were reporting feeling almost almost, almost um, from like symptoms of feeling quite dissociated, feeling highly anxious, feeling very hot. Um, and these are professionals within working within clinical teams and often people don't um, didn't have a didn't feel like they had a forum at them at that time to say to share how they were thinking or feeling. So it, noticing that and actually being able to take a step back when it's just too close to home has been so so valuable and really thinking about yeah self-care who to talk to usually my ideal self-care is to have a cup of tea and a chat and watch lots of just yeah cat videos mainly just something that kind of soothes me and relaxes me and grounds me um is so so important especially working in the field that we work in definitely um we've had some more questions sure that are really good they actually relate a lot to some of the questions that we asked that were asked um, beforehand. So I'm gonna to try to kind of, where I can, piece them together. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of leads on um, from, I think this, this, this one leads in, like, sorry, follows on quite nicely from what you guys were talking about. Um, would you say losing someone to suicide has changed you as a person? I have found that it has deeply affected how I see myself. I've had to do a lot of work on my own self-worth. And we've had an, a few questions like this as well about how suicide has changed, um, like the the people like the the, the bereaved, and also kind of them worrying about themselves and others around them as well. So um, I'll go to Jessica first for that one. Yeah, I love this question because it's something that I was really hoping would like would come up. I think it's so important. Um, yes, absolutely. The day I realised that I was not going to ever be that same person again. Um, was so profound for me because for 
probably about a year and a half, I was like, I can't just wait to be back to me. I can't wait to be back to normal. Um, I can't, you know, when is it, when is everything going to be back to normal? When am I going to be the same person again? And then one day I just realized that I was never going to be that person again because something was so world changing had happened to me. Something, um, something so big had happened to me that I was never, ever, ever going to be that same girl as I was before. That's when I realized I had this opportunity. And, and just like this person said, I did a lot of work on myself. I did a lot of work with, with a lot of therapists. Um, and I did a lot of work on myself. And I came to the point and the conclusion that I had an opportunity there because actually the person that I was before, was she really that great? And was she really the person that I wanted to be? Um, and I then had this opportunity to become, almost go back to basics and build myself into the person that I wanted to be and that I that I could be after this kind of life-changing experience. It, it sounds really, really like weird and witchcrafty, doesn't it? But it was um it was just like this epiphany of, okay, I'm never ever ever gonna be that person again. But is that actually a good thing? And I started building myself up as actually this person that that was much nicer, much less selfish, um had a had um kind of some some goals that weren't just kind of just about me and I would never have got into the work that I'm in um before I would never have even thought about doing charity work or doing anything like that because I was far too selfish and and money driven and it took this awful experience to kind of give me this wake-up call of actually my life is really 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 short um, or you know life is short and I'm wasting it doing things that don't make me happy um why am I doing that and I I um changed so much of myself after um after my dad died so like I changed my whole career um I got rid of all those people that that were just um not right for me people that were kind of just taking 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 and people that were just my friends for i don't know for a party um you know people that weren't really actually truly my friends i got rid of like i got rid of um, my abusive partner um i got rid of family members even that were you know weren't really bringing anything to the table um and i just had this kind of life-changing moment of oh my god my life is short and I'm gonna not waste any of it I'm gonna do something really special with it so yes it changes you as a person and yes you have to do a lot of work to get to that point where that's a positive thing it's not always a negative thing that it's changed as a person and that day of realization that yeah I am a different person the quicker you can get to that point um because it took me a long time so this is like my pearl of wisdom if you can get to that point quicker that's better because the days before that are really, really hard. And that's kind of a turning point um, of when you realize that actually no, I'm, things aren't ever going back to the way they are before. I've now got an opportunity to make them into, into something else. Uh, the quicker you can get to that point, you know, that's our biggest piece of advice for anyone bereaved by suicide, really. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And Farah? Sorry, firstly, I'd like to just apologize. My, my Zoom crashed, so I've had to open another one. No worries. I'm here twice. I uh, hope that's all. I don't know how to fix it, but I will try. Um, I would say suicide has massively changed me as a person. I was introduced to the idea that someone could take their own life when when I was 11. So that was when. So we lost two cousins um, on my mum's side within the same year. So it, it was sort of within. Uh, it was around within a six month period, and I was around 11 or 12. And if I'm completely honest, I just didn't understand that. I didn't, I didn't actually think at that point that that was even possible. Um, and for then that to happen with people who I absolutely adored, and they were just so lovely. And it just, it really shook my, my, my sense of self and my understanding of the world. Um, I would probably say it, it's so, and, and that then changed how I saw people. I, I almost had a greater appreciation of people and also a more of an appreciation for suffering and pain and struggle like I felt like my awareness of um, psychological well-being just massively increased and I was just trying to make sense of the world and always had it almost gave me this kind of curiosity um, for people and people's how people are feeling and how they're doing and and 
and it hugely inspired my my desire to work with others um, who perhaps needed some support or help. Um, so from a very young age, I've done I've worked sort of in in voluntary roles. Um, and from a very young age, wanted to be a psychologist, even probably before I even knew what that meant. <laughs> I just knew that it was what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in the field of mental health and have done since I was um, 18, 19. And it, it almost, it changed me as a person in that it enabled me to connect with people in a way that um, I felt I was able to. And in the way that I, I really valued that, I, I feel like when I was, much younger um you know the world just moves so quick and there's so many things to do and i always found value in just stopping having a cup of tea with someone and really saying you know how are you are you all right can i do anything to support you and and to just have those conversations part of me wonders whether i'm just a very chatty person <laughs> and that that that's just who i am sort of i kind of fell into the role but then the other part of me thinks that's not the case. Um, I, I massively think that because of the, the losses of suicide within the family, it, it hugely inspired me to, to kind of take on this path of, of working in mental health and to, to almost be able to walk alongside other people who were struggling and to maybe play some role in their recovery or to be that person that they feel able to say, I need some help, I'm in pain, how can you help me? And, and to to kind of support other people um, and I think just as a, as a person generally I, I'm much more rebellious in that I do often challenge the, the experience of um, experiencing a suicide bereavement makes me want to challenge narratives or the more dominant narratives around what is and what isn't or what should and what shouldn't be happening so I grew up in a my, my family are from a, a Muslim background I wouldn't say I'm religious at all, but I understand and appreciate the, the religious perspectives um, in terms of how the religion or how religions understand suicide. So I'm often um, trying to play the devil's advocate and, and sort of I have this curiosity about well, what if we think in different ways or what if we you know, um, understand suicide differently, how might that look? what doors might that open for people who feel unable to talk about how they're feeling so it's it's made me a little bit more rebellious in a sense um but also made me a lot more compassionate to to other people towards other people's um emotional pain and and i suppose just more attuned so in my research uh, one of the participants um talked about having this antenna <laughs> um and this antenna for risk almost so always i suppose i am always aware that anyone could be struggling with suicidal feelings so um people who i i love and i'm and people who are in my life at the moment have often expressed that and i felt a bit more able to have a conversation with them perhaps because of previous experiences um so there is an openness that i have and i i i, I get the impression that you have that you guys have that as well as well. I wouldn't be sat here talking about that uh, suicide so I think it, it massively changes you and I think you it changes you in a way that you can't often predict um it almost changes you over time as well yeah yeah absolutely I think yeah definitely this this entire event series wouldn't have happened if if I hadn't had so many bereavements and everything and that combination of things it was kind of the an unpleasant but the perfect storm for opening up these kind of conversations around mental health and starting to understand or kind of not understand or attempt to understand all these different things. Um, I've got um, another question here um, which again reflects so I've had so many come through of just variations of this question it seems to be a really key one what advice what advice would you give to managing flashbacks and nightmares and i'm going to go to jessica for that one. Oh, that's a really it's a really tough question because i i can almost put myself back in that place and i'm back in those shoes and um, i think if those flashbacks and those nightmares and i remember the nightmares really really vividly um of causing you distress i think seeking um some advice from your gp is really important um I, it's hard to speak to your gp at the moment i understand but i think you know that is so important 
what I can tell you is, and someone told me this at the time, and I didn't believe them, um, was it does get better, and it does, um, they don't go away, but they become less and less and less and less. Now, I haven't had a nightmare or a flashback for six months now, which I'll, I'll have one tonight now, I don't know, but um, six months now, and I remember them being every night, every time I closed my eyes, not even when I was asleep, actually, every time I closed my eyes, I couldn't get that image out of my head, um, every time I'd fall asleep and then wake up and fall asleep and wake up, it, they, they were constant, um, and I promise you, they do get better. Um, they, they, they do get less, so they don't become completely non-existent, but they become less and less and less. If you do the work on yourself that you need to do, something that I did was I didn't do that work and I tried to plow myself back into normal life and you know went back to work very quickly um, and tried to distract myself from what was going on. And it was a good year before I sought proper support that I needed. And once I started doing that work on myself, which was a long road and, um, you know, it was various sort of forms of therapy. But once I did that work on myself, things like the flashbacks and the nightmares did get less and less and less. So um, I think if they're, if they're becoming distressing and impacting on your sleep, which is so important, I think reach out to your GP. Um, but um, my little nugget of advice is, you know, I, I promise you they will, they will go away eventually. And I can't tell you when. Um, and I remember that person telling me that at the time saying, I can't tell you when, but I promise you they will. And I didn't believe him, but I do now because, because they have. And I, and I know how, how painful they are and how traumatic and upsetting they are. So I just, you know, I absolutely, whoever's asked that question, I, I really, you know, I, I get it. I mean, from the bereavement session that we did with Megan Devine, who's like refuge in grief, she talked a lot about this because she saw, although she um, didn't experience that bereavement in her life, another bereavement was through suicide, but not that one. She saw her husband basically die in front of her in an accident. And she had, she just couldn't get the images out of her head. And again, she's actually Echo pretty much said the same thing. Um, it Not straight away, but it does, it does get better. It does kind of, go away after a while kind of not go away but it kind of lessens and we talked a lot about you know how long people grieve for etc and trauma is trauma essentially and she was like focused very much on trying to find ways also to process and to get support and help for the trauma that goes alongside the grief and goes alongside this kind of grief in particular as well so I hope that you know everybody gets or can access the help that they need. I think it's really good advice about going to a doctor or going to um, a therapist or, you know, finding someone that can help you. But again, if you go on actually onto that session, um, cause um, uh, Megan is a psychotherapist. She talks about what to look for when it comes to looking for therapists that specialize in that. And also you can follow her online and find out more as well. Um, but Farah, do you have anything to add? I think, I think just building on what, um, what Jessica's mentioned there, you know, it, it does, if it's if it's occurring and if it's occurring often and it's having an impact on your life 100 percent think about um seeing the gp and, and accessing some form of therapy there are lots of we understand so much more now about trauma than than we, we used to and and flashbacks and nightmares they're an, it's an understandable response to a very painful and difficult experience so i think the first thing would be i would say is be kind to yourself and and you know it's a very normal it doesn't feel normal but it's an understandable response in terms of what people are going through and people have witnessed and experienced um and absolutely if it's having an impact on on any areas of your life your relationships your sleep quality your mood just your overall mental health seeking gp support getting a referral in um to to at least be explore the options for therapy um whether that's psychotherapy there's a therapy called emdr which has been which people find quite helpful in managing trauma, um, specifically with nightmare, nightmares and flashbacks. You know, we understand that as, as our way of trying to understand and process this difficult experience that we've, we've gone through. Um, and often when you're doing that alongside someone within a the therapeutic space, whether that's individually or within a group, that in itself can be so self-healing. You know, you'll learn strategies, you'll learn tools to cope, um, you'll, you'll build that resilience that, that you have within you. Um, and it does take time, it does take commitment, as Jessica's quite rightly said. 
Um, but if that's something that's impacting you, I would def I would definitely encourage you not to not to, to suffer alone um, and to reach out. And because there are services that are available, it's there are free services um, that you can access to get treatment for that. And I think more and more now, suicide the impact of suicide bereavement is much more on in the kind of conscious awareness now than it has been previously you know we understand that it's a, there's, it relates to traumatic grief um and there are services that i understand are sort of deliver more specialized um psychotherapy for people who have experienced suicide uh, bereavement so to, to yes whoever whoever has mentioned that it's so reassuring isn't it to hear from someone else that it will and can get easier over time or better over time or it can feel less overwhelming or perhaps it might have less of an impact on you over time but but i would definitely encourage you not to to, to kind of be alone and sit with that you know i think seeking therapy has so many advantages and more often than not it can fill you up and, and build that resilience and just remind you of how much of a strong person you are and, and although the the memory of that person or the experience of the suicide it will it's something that will stay with us forever but it's it's our response to the the memory and the experience and the response to the traumatic experience that we have that control um that, that's within our um that's within our hands and i think yeah reach out to the right people um and if that's something you'd like to talk about in a bit more detail in terms of where, what that might look like or where to go to um it would just let yolanda know and i'm happy to have a conversation with you about that thank you so much um another question that we've received again so many of these questions that have come through mm -hmm. everybody really is asking so much of the same things so it just shows what you like a universal experience um and like that everyone's having alongside also their individualized grief there is kind of these universal questions mm -hmm. um, i hear a lot in suicide i hear a lot of um sorry goodness i can't read this. i hear a lot of suicide prevention messages that all suicides are preventable as someone who has lost someone to suicide this is very upsetting i'm not sure if they are all preventable what are your thoughts um i'll go to jessica first for that one yeah it's a really good question actually um so when we deliver our suicide prevention training this is something that we always kind of bring up right at the start because there are people that are there that have lost someone to suicide and I, i've been there when i went on the training not long after i lost my dad and I learned about all these things that I could have done, but didn't do. And that didn't help me one, one little bit. In fact, it, it pushed me to breaking point. Um, mm -hmm. Some suicides are preventable. Not all suicides are preventable. So you have the people um, that, um, that are open about their thoughts of suicide, that, that detail to you what that method looks like and are, uh, you know, are open to you disabling that method and, and getting rid of that method because you know there's, there's a part of them that's that's unsure and you know not convinced that that's really the right answer subconsciously but then you have the people that actually they've made their mind up and they're not open about that with anybody um and those suicides they're not preventable are they so if nobody knows about it um, and this person hasn't given out any any warning signs about it it can be so painful to hear that Oh, well that could have been preventable if you did xyz um and i think it's about not looking at that whole picture of oh all suicide is preventable um yes some suicides are suicides aren't but i think it's about looking at that that own personal picture that you've got and that you know that experience that you've got and not likening it to someone else and and their experience and the wider message i think these messages of, of um suicides are preventable are incredibly well-meaning um, because they encourage people to um, to disclose those thoughts and feelings and they encourage people to have conversations with, with other people about suicide that they might not have had before um, because they didn't think you know there was that there was any point in doing that um, so I, I, and we put a lot of messages about you know um you know suicide can be pre preventable if the right person's having the right conversation um and i think it's about how damaging is that to someone that's bereaved by suicide um especially if they're already questioning all those things of could i have done something what if this what if that and all that guilt 
Um, and I think it's about just not comparing yourself to other people, recognising that, yes, a lot of suicides are preventable, but not 100% of suicides are preventable. Um, it's, a, it's a really unhealthy message to, to give out, isn't it? Mm, definitely. Um, and Safara, I've got another question here, which is just echoes some of the things that you said earlier. Um, what if people have problems talking about it and then other people have questions? Because it's one thing, I guess, for, you know, like as Jessica was saying, there are people that don't know what to say. And then there may be people that will say something silly. Um, there may be people that will disappear. But what if people from, say, outside your unit have has questions? How can people deal um, with that? And how can people set boundaries if they need to? That, that can often, that, yeah, that does happen, doesn't it? And that, that's a really, that can put people in a very uncomfortable position. Um, and I imagine a very exhausting position um, and one that can, can bring up so many feelings for for um, ourselves and I think my advice in that particular situation would be to to be honest and say actually this isn't this is something that I'm still making sense of I'm still processing and and it's not something I feel able to to talk about in in as, in as much detail at the moment I'm not sure whether that feels comfortable and I'm very aware that that probably feels perhaps uh, uh, unsafe to say but I think it's about honoring your your own position and if that's not something that you feel able or ready to disclose or talk about and answer questions about at that particular time then don't um, it might be finding out finding some strategies that might remove you from that situation whether that's to take a take a break take a phone call send a message if, if that's kind of what feels more comfortable or maybe just having a conversation with the person if it's on a one-to-one -one and actually saying, do you know what, I, I appreciate that these are the questions you have. I'm not really able to, to answer them at the moment. Here is if you want to learn some more information or if you want to do some more reading, I'm sure you know they can find or locate that. Um, but if that's not if you're not able to talk about that, then you, you shouldn't feel um, you shouldn't feel, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Uh, you shouldn't feel that, that you shouldn't have to shoulder that responsibility if it's not something that you feel you're you're ready or able to do at that time, and that's okay too. I would definitely say um, when I it, with the suicide bereavement that we've had, both professionally and personally, I wasn't able to really talk about it in depth for a really long time because I had to make sense of it and understand it and understand think about how I would like to explain it and what, what language I want to use and what feels comfortable. Um, and, and for some people it might not ever feel comfortable to talk about and, and that's okay as well. Um, it's really sort of taking that kind of non-judgmental position and that all responses are all right. And, and other people, if they do have that curiosity and they would like to talk about it, they, sh you know, in my, in my in the ideal world people should be asking questions with an awareness that the person has a, a choice whether to respond to that or not um, and that's okay to be kind to yourself if that's something that you ever have to 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 do yeah i mean it's 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 again a question that we had in lots of different variations lots mm -hmm. of forms and some people were giving examples of things as well and you know having had bereavements so we know that people can there are lots of different reactions to grief from the people external to it whether it's not saying anything whether it's maybe sometimes being a little bit unreasonable they don't understand it they're scared of it and asking questions and overstepping those boundaries and you know you're just saying hopefully they should know if they're asking the question that you may you don't you can choose not to answer but i guess that sometimes people may not have that reaction and you may still have to be slightly firmer in your boundaries um jessica is this something that you found at all yeah, now I've always been very open about it um, because that was part of my way of, of dealing with my grief, I suppose. But a question that I get asked often, even now, that it, it gets me, like it gets my breath because I, like, I actually don't know how to answer it and I find it so uncomfortable and really triggering it right back is, um, why do you think your dad did that? And I'm like, oh, um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question because I've actually spent the last four years trying to work it out myself. And when I know the answer to that, I, I'll, I'll give you a shout, I'll let you know. Um, because actually I've spent such a long time trying to get myself away from why did he do that? I've done so much work on myself 
to stop myself questioning why did he do that and people think it's um, completely appropriate. Um, people that you don't really know think it's very appropriate to say, why do you think your dad killed himself? And, um, and that's the one that really stands out for me. And I'm a very open person. Um, but that's the one that stands out for me as being a really difficult question. Um, and at first, I used to kind of try and answer it. And I'd just kind of try and say some words until I felt like they were satisfied and then I'd leave it um and now I'm just much more boundary with that and I just say do you know what I, I, I don't know the answer to that I'm never going to know the answer to that and um I'm not really comfortable talking about it and I set those boundaries and I'm just you know really firm with, with those boundaries because those boundaries keep me keep me well mm -hmm. brilliant um I've had a, another question that kind of, I think, feeds into this, and it'll be interesting to hear what you both have to say. Um, so a few people have said that um, people in their, you know, people in fa families, families are, are tricky. Sometimes they're amazing, sometimes they're not. <laughs> and then when something happens like this, we do know even the tightest families can be pulled apart and it can be really tricky. And especially with the subjects like, you know, especially with suicide when everybody has their own ideas, thoughts, feelings. How can people cope with differing responses within the family unit while still kind of, I suppose, looking after themselves, but then also being mindful of others? Um, I'll go to you first, Fire, with that one. Um, so I'm, I'm just writing down these questions because I think they're so fantastic and I just want to hold them in mind. Um, I think this is a question that I'm really connecting to. Um, so I think, I think you're right, you know, families are so incredibly, can be very complicated and wonderful at the same time. So there's that both and that's coming up again. Um, and I would say when, when we experienced the, the suicide bereavement and, and they, they occurred in 2001 and we're almost, well, we're gonna be in 2021, so almost 20 years ago. And I would probably say we still haven't been able to have a frank, honest conversation about why, or, what happened and why this happened and and I remember I remember going to my aunt's house and they are very they are quite religious and the way they think about mental health and suicide infuriated me um if it's okay can I can I give an example is, is yeah that, that right? um so I remember and I absolutely adore I feel like I need to say a caveat I absolutely adore my auntie she's wonderful um she lost her son her son was 21 at the time um, and she uh, quite recently around sort of three to four years ago on the dinner table was talking about we were talking about mental health problems and and um, it came up in the conversation that people who struggle with their mental health are, are she, she implied that they were that she understood it to be that people were, were just bad and that people who take their own life is and she feels like that that's similar a similar situation for them she didn't understand the impact of our mental the, of trauma or difficult or struggles on our mental health she just kind of ruled everything as this mental health doesn't exist this is a concept that you seem to be talking about the way i understand it is people are just good and bad mm -hmm. and i found myself kind of right like right now going incredibly hot um, i was in her home she's lost her son i i feel an enormous amount of respect for her but i could not agree with her position I couldn't I was apps I was so angry but equally I, I tried my best to introduce some different perspectives and and by that I was I was talking about um, how how inequality affects our mental health well, I was talking about our depression anxiety and and trauma um, and try to kind of introduce new ideas or not, not generally new ideas but perhaps to her kind of novel ideas they were very much shut down and I think I ended up having to accept within myself that she's coming from a very different perspective in terms of her upbringing and culture and religious background and we definitely had to agree to disagree but I did not budge from my angle from my position in that I feel that it's important to recognize um, emotional suffering and to, to res pay and respect that um, and she did not and that was something that I wasn't going to change over a dinner, <laughs> over the dinner table, unfortunately. However, I was hoping that I'd planted a seed 
um, in that I could perhaps introduce this different way of conceptualizing mental health or conceptualizing suicide for her and that hopefully she would have been thinking of, she might think about that conversation in the future i don't know and and i don't know if it has um, we still get on wonderfully we just it's interesting because we just don't we don't engage in that conversation which i wonder what that's about but the what, what I could have done, and I'm really proud that I did that uh, in terms of just introducing these ideas and holding my own position and being aware that I'm not probably going, I'm unlikely to shift the, the, the mindsets of my family. You know, very incredible and um, sometimes very stubborn people. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I think for me, it, it was unhelpful to think that I was going to, you know, kind of go in and change this change how they think because they quite rightly are you know within their right to say that i'm i'm the way that i'm understanding this isn't accurate or it's not right and in my mind again it's not about necessarily being right but it's about thinking about what what works and what fits and what's more respectful for that person i could never agree with how my family or how she in particular understands mental health but i can hope that i've planted a little bit of a seed that she can hold on to and and i think going back to what Jessica said earlier about feeling at peace with that and, and knowing that that's, you know, that often you kind of want to change the world and, and it kind of feels like this enormous task, but sometimes it's kind of chipping away at things really slowly, one step at a time. And I think that's how I cope with the, the differentiating responses within the family. It's kind of a little nudge here, a little, a new idea here, a wonder, a thought. I try and not be, it's very easy for me to perhaps, um, come in all guns blazing and saying this is what I think and this is you know this is how this is the literature and stuff but that wouldn't connect with them that that's not how they would they wouldn't receive that very well so it's kind of a very gentle easing of you know I wonder if this is what's going on and just hoping that that creates some flexibility in in how they're thinking even if they don't show it I can hope that it's 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 um introduced a new way of thinking or a different idea yeah and i think i like what you said there as well it's about saying you've kind of said it you can hope for it but then you also just have to accept that that might might not be the case and yeah. uh, on yesterday's session megan talked about that as well because she said we have to look at grief as i suppose it's also an individualized experience because everyone's lost someone you've all lost the same person but everyone's lost someone different in their lives and they have a different connection to them and that has to i suppose that person's connection and that their grief has to play out however it works to play out for them but then yeah. making sure that you have boundaries to protect yourself and mm -hmm. you know also you know go through your own healing process um mm -hmm. do you have anything to add on that jessica yeah i think um i had this idea when my dad died um and our family was quite fragmented as it was anyway i had this idea that it was going to be a bit like on the movies that this this experience pulled everyone together and we all then like loved each other and worked together to move forward and it couldn't have been further from the truth and mm -hmm. suicide doesn't bring the best out in people does it you know bereavement any kind of bereavement um you know funerals are are always a um, a difficult time for everybody but um bereavement by suicide because people are dealing with so much stuff so much different stuff and like you said each person's lost someone different to them, even though it's the same person. It absolutely didn't bring the right, uh, the, the best out in our family at all. And we um, had quite a lot of fallings out. And um, from my point of view, um, my dad's death needed to be recorded as a suicide. And it, initially it wasn't. Um, it was recorded as an alcohol related death because he had a drink at the time. Um, and I fought for a year in the coroner's court to have that recognized as an alcohol as a, as a suicide because i didn't want that those false stats going in the system and um and i thought well why why should we kind of um brush it under the carpet and pretend like we've got something to be ashamed of um so i fought for that to be changed and to be recognized as a suicide and to go on our stats as a suicide but other members of our family really disagreed with that mm -hmm. and kind of say like why would we want people to know that it's a suicide why don't we just let it be something else which to me was completely um like no that no um absolutely not um and i do remember hearing stories um we were never particularly close with my with my dad's wife anyway um but that's a story for another day um but i do remember hearing stories of her telling people 
um, locally to where they lived that he died of a heart attack because she was so ashamed that he died by suicide. And to me, that is just, that, that's the opposite of what I've done with my life. Like my project is named after my dad, my charity is named after my dad. And you know, my story's out there for everybody to read and everyone to identify with if, if they do. And, and I'm so super open and honest about it, but we have family members that are like, no, this is something we sweep under the carpet, we do not talk about. Um, and that's their stuff and this is my stuff and I can only control my stuff. So much like Farah, I got to a point that I thought, okay, I can only, I can only control myself and I can only control what I believe and what I do and how I behave and I can't control other people. But um, I think family fallouts are always very common after a death, but especially common after a, a bereavement by suicide. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the other questions, a lot of questions that we have are about support, support systems, um, and I think it kind of, again, it kind of going, echoing and going back to things that uh, you said, Jessica, and actually I think you've touched upon a little bit as well, Farah, about kind of how people behave around, around people that are bereaved. Um, and that, that can have an impact on you. You've got enough to be dealing with, and then you have to deal with other people's behavior as well. Um, and obviously for some bits, because people are scared, they don't know what to say, et cetera. But at the time, you know, who's got time to be understanding of other people when you have so much going on? Um, so what can people do? So there's a few scenarios that have been for us. So what can people do if they do not have a support system? Um, like how can they, where can they find help? Um, and also where, what can people do if, like for example, um, there is a really good article on HuffPost, um, which is 11 things that you can do for um, someone that has been bereaved. And it's literally like the fourth most popular one for years. It was the fourth most popular article. And how people used it was they would, if people asked what they wanted, they would just send the article and then people could just say, look, I don't know what I, don't know what I want, but all these things seem helpful. Um, so what can people do to build up a support system or kind of reach out to people for help. I'll go too far for that one first. I think first and foremost, what I'm thinking about is, is the people, you'd be so surprised how many people have lost a, have known someone who has taken their life. It never, it, it always surprises me um, that through a conversation or through revealing of my own, um, that I have experienced a suicide bereavement, how many other people have also shared the, their own experiences? And it, it always astounds me. Um, and I always value those conversations so much. I think there is something about in reaching out, if, if people have a, a network of people, then starting those conversations. And sometimes it's a very informal conversation. I remember having a conversation quite recently with um, someone at, at work, um, in the staff room, I was making a cup of tea and a conversation just emerged and I happened to, to talk about suicide bereavement being something that had it happened in my family and it just sparked a conversation. And through that, it was just, it's just been really interesting because we've just had this kind of connection now and we don't necessarily work alongside each other just in the same building, but it was something that we shared. So I, I think the, initial, the first thing I would say is if it feels okay, if it feels comfortable, if it's the right type of setting or relationship when, you know, don't necessarily feel that you can't share that. It's something that's, that is an empty, it's a part of you. It's a story that you have. And if it feels appropriate to do so, share, share that with someone else. You, you might be surprised by who connects or who resonates with that or who might have something to, to relate to. Um, I would say social media has many platforms. I'm not massively familiar as Yolanda will say I had no idea what this this panel <laughs> would have involved today um, I'm not overly familiar but I imagine that there are lots of organizations much like Jessica's um, I know SOBS is one uh, specifically for people who are bereaved by suicide but there are um, others such as Calm where they have platforms where people can connect um, and, and reach out to each other virtually um, I, th I think it is it's quite tricky but you know thinking about if you're at, if you're aligned with a university or a college or a school um reach out to the pastoral support or the counseling services it might not be that you you know if you don't want to access access counseling services that's okay but it might be that there's a, a well-being group 
or a, a program that they might be running that might be of interest to you in terms of starting to build that, that network around you. See what's happening in the community, in um, community centres. I know that it's a really difficult time at the moment with COVID restrictions, but I'm always pleasantly surprised by the different, gra the different grassroots projects that are available, um, whether that's um, something that's kind of happening in the community centre or outdoors. I'm a massive fan of community psychology and um, outdoor based um, groups and activities, so gardening projects, uh, cooking projects, doing things that perhaps don't necessarily um, involve you know, visibly people who um, have experience with suicide bereavement. But again, it's broadening your, your network, giving you that opportunity to start those conversations. And again, it's about other people might also connect with your story if that's something you, you want to share. Um, I'm not sure if you'd add anything else to that, Jessica. You're probably more familiar with with the more the, the more um, NGO organisations. I think I've been in the NHS for a bit too long. <laughs> I don't. Really, I'm not too familiar with anything else. You've covered it really nicely, and I think it's really hard to to give details of organisations when um, they're very often grassroots organisations, which mean they're area specific, aren't they? Um, so it would be really hard for me because I'm Merseyside based. It would be really hard for me to tell you what what's going on in, in London or something like that but the support is out there um, I think what you said about if, it, if you feel comfortable doing so kind of opening yourself up to that um, and and letting it be kind of known and I think if I mean if if I'm keeping it a secret and if I'm not telling anyone that I'm bereaved by suicide then how many other people are doing the exact same thing and how many other people are so relieved when I say, oh, I'm bereaved by suicide. And it, oh, actually I am too, thank God you've mentioned it because I've been wanting to talk to someone about it for ages. Um, and that's something that I've found a, a lot over the years. I'm always very shocked, like you said, by the amount of people that have lost someone to suicide. In fact, I struggle to find someone that's not lost someone to suicide um, yeah. in my life. Mm. I think I kind of start to put myself out there as, someone that was bereaved by suicide you know all those friends that I lost in the early days after I lost my dad all those friends that I lost they've all been replaced tenfold by people that um actually they're much better relationships and and um, the you know, other people that have, have lost someone as well and we've all supported each other massively and people that I would never have sparked a friendship with before and unfortunately the thing we have in common is that we've lost someone we love to suicide but actually once we've built a relationship on that we've ended up becoming like the best of friends mm -hmm. and I've got this beautiful support network around me like the majority of my staff and volunteers are people that are bereaved by suicide that want to make a difference and those people help me more than I've ever helped them just by being there just by mm -hmm. being people that just they, they get it don't they um and i think none of us have a natural support system i think we're very very lucky if we have a natural support system that's there for something as profound as bereavement by suicide if you've got that cling on to it tight because you are super lucky but i think it's very rare um i think our expectation is that that, that we've got that um and it is a bit earth shattering when we realize that we don't but uh, one of the best things i ever did was was rebuilding my own support network and making it full of people that actually really wanted them they wanted me there mm -hmm. and um sobs was massive for me sobs was um incredible and they're all around the country survivors of bereavement by suicide stick it in on google and it gives you like a you put your postcode in and it tells you where your closest one is that was amazing and um and i did take to facebook a little bit as well and i found there were a lot of area specific um bereavement by suicide groups where people just kind of came together and had a brew every now and then or had a phone call and just vented and, and said the things that you can't say in mm -hmm. the real world um i found that massively helpful i think it, 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 it's really the most surprising times or people that you might find that connection with um, it might be um, I don't know, the person that you might sit next to at university or college or it might be the person that you sit next to at work or if you're having a casual conversation with someone quite randomly. I've massively agree with you, Jessica. I've, I've, I'm more often coming across people who have also lost a loved one to suicide um, 
and it blows me away how often it has happened yet it's a conversation that's so scarcely had um and and yeah so it's it's it will take it does take some courage um but often once that initial kind of connection is made it just feels so much more natural to talk um and and yeah i would say some of my long lasting friendships uh you know, we it's with people who also share that personal that personal connection. And that's really helpful, Yolanda. You're you're putting some really interesting um, links up. Um, somebody also suggested Winston's wish. I'm just looking for the URL for it now, so I can share it. But I've just I, I've added in the details um, into the chat for Sobs and also for um, like for Martin Gallia project as well. Um, yeah. So I'm just adding in a few different a few different links just yeah. to signpost to. Uh, where people can get help because we're two minutes from the end now but I definitely definitely think that this is something that I think that we can um, certainly at some point we'll go for our diaries and repeat because there was there are so many more questions um, that we've got um, that have people have sent in as well so I think if we can definitely reconvene um, and go through the rest because there are other things as well people know how to talk to children about suicide and mm -hmm. um, you know kind of being concerned about themselves and others and yeah i definitely will we will i'll be in touch with everyone as well to try to organize like a kind of a second sitting as it were um but thank you so so much for joining me jessica and farah um jessica where um i've added in the url but is there anywhere else that you'd like um, us to signpost to at all um yeah i, I mean there's so many organizations out there aren't there um for um, for bereavement by suicide and for people considering suicide, and I think you're you you know you're pretty okay with them all. But I'm just thinking about these people that have questions. Mm -hmm. If anyone's got you know a burning question and they and they want to direct it at me, I'm happy for you to share my email in the in yeah. the um, links because um, I know how horrible it can be to sit on those questions and yeah. you know yeah. So I'm I'm more than happy to. Um, I might not get back straight away, but obviously. Just share my email and, and people can but yeah i've gone through um, the ones that have come through live because i wanted to make sure they were done but we just have a few from the ones that asked beforehand so i can certainly like direct them to both of you as well um and yeah. then i'll add i'm just going to pop your email address into this bit too right. well, I'm, I'm more than happy to do this again um yeah Amazing. definitely that's be great and, and thank you so much um to everyone for joining us we'll definitely definitely we'll sort something out as soon as possible um, mm -hmm. and pop something in the diary and I will message everyone through Eventbrite. Um, I've just added Jessica's email in there as well. And also if you do have any additional questions, I'm just adding in the speak on email too. Um, if anyone has any questions, then feel free to hit me up um, and hit Jessica up and then I can pass everything on to Farah as well and we can get additional questions asked and yeah. But yeah, thank you so much um, for attending. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope this has been helpful for people that have been here today. Um, and make, please make sure everybody's taking care, taking care of yourself. Obviously, grief is, is a hard thing to carry. And it's something that is, this is a shared experience we all have right now on this on this on this particular mm -hmm. talk we've mm -hmm. something that we've all experienced in in different just in slightly different ways in terms of maybe the different relationships we have i think the main thing we know that we can all agree on is trying to prioritize our self-care uh trying to make sure we're looking after ourselves if anyone needs help please reach out um and you know just really just try to take care of yourselves it's a really tricky year and it's a harder year for us to connect with us, others and reach out to to others etc so please you know know you're not alone and if anything if you feel like you are please 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 email and i will direct you to the the right people or direct you to as many people that can help you as possible Definitely. yeah and and I, I, just, I, I just add something to that yeah, so i just want to say thank you to, to you to you both and to everyone attending i think for, for me it's been a very moving session I, I can honestly say I don't think I've had such an in-depth conversation such an honest and frank conversation with people and people listening I'm in this type of forum this is incredibly new but I've, I've found it so valuable just sort of listening to your reflections um, and I've learned so much from you all as well so yeah thank you for, for inviting me along <laughs> uh, thank you and also thank you both of you for sharing so much of your personal experience as well that's again when people share 
it does open it does open up opportunities for people to start reflecting on things but then also to realize other people are going through the same things and know that they can share as well but obviously within sharing please always make sure that you're looking after yourself as well because you can open the floodgates so make sure you have your boundaries set and <laughs> you're taking care of yourself uh, but thank you so much for joining me and um have an amazing thank evening you. everyone thank you Bye. thank you take care yeah.